Martine is asking, wondering if somebody's already done this, um, what are some solutions that exist today for disaster recovery active, active, for active active Kubernetes clusters where traffic can be partially switched over uh, and uh, ensure security at a granular pod level? Um, some solutions out there that he's seen for this is like Portworks has something. Uh, this is really the category of what the uh, service mesh offerings provide. Uh, if we're talking about some of the you know, commercial ones like the console service mesh, this is what you get when you go to the uh, enterprise uh, tiers of it. Uh, if we're talking about vanilla Kubernetes, you, know, you have federated Kubernetes where you can have a network that spans the clusters, but that still doesn't help with encryption. So it comes down to the service mesh that you're using. Um, Martin, since you're on the call, do you want to add additional context to the, the use case, the problem that you have and what you've, uh, what you're doing today? So I was wondering the, 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 the networking between the, the Kubernetes clusters had to be some kind of mesh that yeah. this is what I get, but I also, I, I'm thinking who should be, who should be responsible for switching the traffic? Yeah. It should be something outside of both clusters, right? Well, we're talking active, active here. So I, I don't think that it's a person that makes that. I think it's based on the health and the routing uh, setup that you would have. I argue though that, there, well, look, let's talk about active, active first of all, and it means different things to different people. Let's talk about what some of the design patterns are for active, active. And this is one pattern where you're solving it at the control plane layer kind of, or your, your, your shared platform layer. But there's another way it can be done as well. So for the shared platform here, we're talking, you have you know, Kubernetes cluster, let's say in the East Coast, Kubernetes cluster on the West Coast, or let's say you're both, you know, for performance reasons, they're just in two different regions uh, on the East Coast. So East one, East two, for example. We could set up a service mesh that connects those two clusters and the services are able to discover each other based on facilities of the service mesh. Uh, mostly it's DNS based usually. Um, in this scenario, it's simpler from the deployment perspective that, hey, we just deploy something to one of these clusters or both of these clusters and the failover mechanisms we have in place, which I'm just hand waving here. Let's just assume those are gonna work fine. But it introduces a lot of other concerns and complexity about uh, tenancy, latency, uh, you know, database connections and performance, IAM considerations I, uh, between these two uh, regions, DNS, etc. I think few companies manage the sophistication of an architecture like that that attend my office hours. <laughs> uh, th th those are companies uh, like a Netflix uh, th that have had to figure it out as a necessity. I think there's a simpler way possibly for companies to also think about active active. And that is do it at, at a layer outside of the cluster itself. So with it, so things aren't balancing moving between pods are not moving between clusters. Clusters are totally disjoint. Clusters provide a service. Think of the cluster as itself, almost as a pod in itself. And then you have another cluster that provides the same capabilities. And then you have your CDN layer or your WAF layer that is responsible for routing traffic to both of those clusters. And then you have other considerations as well as how you're doing active active. Is it based on sharding? Can you have tenants? You know, can you have uh, different tenants in different clusters? So you, you know, in an outage situation, some percentage of your customers are offline, but not everyone is offline. Do you have a way to migrate customers or tenants from one cluster to another cluster uh, that you're solving that way? What I like about this is architecturally, it's rather simple because you're still thinking about just this cluster. You're still thinking about this cluster and you're just thinking about how you're sending traffic between them. Yeah. Vlad posted, a, yeah. Vlad posted a, a YouTube video from AWS reInvent. I had the same thought to post something up from like one of the KubeCons because this is something that's this is something that's hot topic, you know, when it comes to doing 
KubeCon talks. Um, I know like the last KubeCon I went to was, you know, before COVID 2019 or whatever, but like Uber did a great one, you know, on how they do this kind of stuff. Well, I would definitely peruse YouTube for a little bit, try to find, you know, go find Uber's talk. They do one every KubeCon. Like they, yeah. they're just, they're, they're Kubernetes masters over they there. Are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyone on the call have, have some solution in place for that? Yeah, anyone? I, do it. Yeah. I designed and implemented and ran a bunch of uh, multi-region, including active, active applications in production. It's a huge pain, first of all. And I highly recommend you uh, watch the YouTube video from reInvent. I posted bo it both in the Zoom chat and in the thread on Slack. You're also mentioning two things there, disaster recovery and active active. Those are not necessarily paired together because yeah. yes, you can do disaster recovery in an active active scenario. I'm not, uh, I'm not denying that, but you can do disaster recovery without active active, which is something that is extremely, extremely complex to do. It is super hard. And yeah, it, at Uber scale, it makes sense. I'm not Uber. I'm cool, but I'm not Uber levels yeah. of cool. <laughs> and your application is not just Kubernetes. It's not just containers. Yeah. It's not yeah. just pods. Your application is IAM roles. Your application is VPCs. Your application is probably ECR repositories. Your yeah. application is RDS. Tomito and Kinesis. Yeah. Even if by some miracle you re-implement all that in Kubernetes yourself, which would really be a miracle, but I'm not going to go into that. Even if you do that, you still have a bunch of dependencies. And yeah, the way to do it is at a higher level than Kubernetes through some routing, either at CDN, either doing Lambda at Edge, either with Route 53, hell checks, and latency routing and things like that. All of these are better explained, way, way better than I can explain them in the YouTube video uh, that I linked. So I highly recommend you go check that out. For mm -hmm. Kubernetes itself, there are options uh there are specifically disaster recovery options like what was it heptios arc that got renamed into something else that can uh backup thing in your clusters and then you can configure those backups to go from your region to another region but that's gonna have a relatively high mttr time so it's gonna take a while for you to recover not ideal you're mentioning active active, so I imagine you want something very tiny there. And again, it gets super, super weird. And it's very well explained in the YouTube video. A mentor much smarter than myself once told me, and he was talking about um, people that want cross cloud, you know, but I, I think it follows under the same category. And he said there's only two reasons why you would do it, why you would do it. Either you lose more money than you would spend when you have downtime. So like if you're losing tens of millions of dollars a minute, you know, if you're Amazon or something, or if people will literally die if the service goes down, like those are the only two times that we, we're ever gonna do something like this. Yeah, nowadays it's really easy to lose millions of dollars in a minute downtime. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I, I heard recently a story from one of our customers that was similar to this. They were down for four hours and lost a lot. Yeah, I can't go bankrupt after four hours of... Yeah, uh, or in, in HFT, they can't exit the market. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I had a customer one time who uh, was a company that serviced airlines with their food. And they actually told us that um, they they lost something like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a minute for every minute that they couldn't put like food on planes, basically. So if their systems that controlled all that went down, it was wow. You know, it, it was pretty uh, expensive. <laughs> but I mean, it, you're getting up into Uber scale type stuff, right? Yeah. Like you've got you've got teams of DevOps you know, people working on it. Yeah, serious systems architecture engineering. But getting back to the question, we have right now in place, uh, we have DNS solution, which is outside of the cluster. So the, we, we don't know any internals of the cluster. 
And right now, if we expose it, like literally anything can, co can connect to it from our cluster because, uh, because this is how it works, right? It's on a network level. And I'm not sure how to, how to follow that and, and restrict and if, if it's even possible with, with that approach. Yeah, so like uh, de partially degraded scenarios where uh, it, it's not black and white whether or not to send traffic or not to this cluster. I think that's really difficult to to uh, ascertain, and there is no generic answer to it. <laughs> the sadness on the on the call. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I want to have the silver bullet for this one, but I, I yeah I expect as much. Hey, yeah, uh, Eric. Uh, one thing co comes to mind when you mentioned high frequency trading, I was running, I built and, or had built and ran an early high frequency trading uh, uh, routing system. And um, well, you guys will appreciate that. It, it was a, a JavaScript layer on top of a Java engine and the way they built it, every single transaction was uh, not just transaction, but message back and forth was persisted in memory. That just completely killed me twice. They didn't figure it out till the second time. I got fired over it. But in terms of, <laughs> yeah, so it's worth, it's worth mentioning this. What I learned was that if I had some good reporting and I could hand over to my manual traders what my position was, they could have traded out of that, to your uh, earlier point. But that brings it, you know, that's just to mention a larger issue of it's not always a technological solution. Yeah. I like that. And it's it, w w what you're saying is um, you can use active active as your, uh, you know, for agility, but also for DR. But maybe you need a DR thing, a strategy when even active active isn't enough. Uh, and how are you going to back yourself out when all that technology that you had invested to support active active fails you? Uh, well, maybe you just need that simple report <laughs> to get you out of the situation to bring Imagine up an ally. surprise when I learned that $40,000 yeah. and a job later. Yeah. Sorry, I had to learn that the hard way. That's my, my life in general. Uh, there's no mm -hmm. shortcut for hard lessons learned.